Hi, I'm Doug Ullman, and I'm standing here at Petersburg National Battlefield, not far from War Fort Welsh, the end of the Union Line at Petersburg. Now, as a longtime employee of the Trust, this is a place where I'm particularly proud to stand because over my shoulder is land that was preserved by the Trust and its members that has since been returned to its wartime appearance. And this is my first time coming out here in a few years, and the view you see here is is as close to what it have, would have looked like in 1865 as absolutely possible. Now to talk about the actions in 1865, we're gonna bring on one of our founders and our good friend, Will Green. Thanks, Doug. One of the great things about uh, being here uh, uh, at this strip of land that is owned by the Na has been owned by the National Park Service since its inception is that you have the best view of the way that the Union Army constructed its fortifications around Petersburg. And there were three basic types of fortifications that the Federals constructed. Of course, the most ubiquitous is the infantry curtains or the infantry trenches. And you can see a stretch of them that have been cleared of brush right over here behind my left shoulder. Those infantry curtains would connect all of the larger fortifications around the entire Petersburg perimeter. And then the next thing that would be entered in would be an artillery battery, a series of lunettes open at the rear. And here is a wonderful view of Battery 26, which is uh, in an excellent state of preservation, uh, that you can see all of the traverses and the uh, embrasures for the guns that were here. And in this case, it was a huge, a huge battery uh, that had at least eight artillery positions in it. And then the next feature that we'll come to in a few minutes is an enclosed fort or redoubt. And in this case, uh, we're talking about Fort Welch, which we'll see here in a couple of minutes. In fact, you can probably see it in the distance uh, right now. Uh, now, well, now while, while we walk, and let's keep walking so we can keep moving here, but. Uh... You know, naturally, because these look so good, they look incredible, right? Obviously, these were preserved early on by some organization, and they've been restacked and changed and everything, right? No, this, this is the... Well, that's a setup, Gary. Yeah. You're not fooling anybody. You, you knew this. Uh, these are all original, and uh, this, these were preserved as the original part of the park back in the 1920s and 1930s. What, what the initiative of the Trust has done was to clear them. Uh, back in the back in the in the days prior to the trust's action out here, uh, this trail was almost never used by anybody. I would come out here because I knew it was here and I thought it was so neat. But it was all all these earthworks were covered with brush, and it was very difficult to see them and make out a, a field of fire, let alone the profile of the earthworks themselves. But with the initiative of the trust saving this land. The Park Service cooperated by clearing all the brush off of this, off of these works. And you can see this is a remarkable uh, series of fortifications here. And when you come from the other side and you look at it from the Confederate perspective, these uh, pop up out of the landscape remarkably and is still intimidating if you think you were going to attack it. I think this kind of goes without saying, but the reason that the Federals constructed their fortifications the way they did, here's, look at this traverse. You know, and, uh, and we all know that Traverse was a, a, a perpendicular earthwork that separated positions uh, in order to interdict any kind of uh, enfilading fire. The reason the Federals did this is they wanted to have an interlocking field of fire with artillery everywhere along the line so that each of the batteries and forts were positioned in such a way that they could support one another on both flanks. Nowhere out in front of these works would a, an attacker be immune from artillery fire unless they happen to be in a wrinkle of the land that provided a small amount of defilade. There we go. <laughs> you're, you're forcing Doug onto the earthwork. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm walking backwards. It's hard enough for an old man like me to walk forwards, let alone backwards and talk <laughs> at the same time. So that was, that's the general scheme. And you would see this all along the entire uh, federal line of Petersburg, but only here are they all preserved in their pristine condition, one after another, uh, that you can really get a, a sense of the uh, light way that the, the fortifications were constructed. And of course, this became the main Union line after the fifth Union offensive in late September and early October of 1864. After those fights, 
the Federals extended their lines and built these works. Uh, there is one more fort that's a little difficult to get to called Fort Gregg, Union Fort Gregg, not to be confused with Confederate Fort Gregg. And it, it, it basically refused the flank, and then in the distance there's another fort called Fort Wheaton. And this was, this was kind of a, uh, kind of a horseshoe type shape, a fish hook, sometimes the Park Service calls it the fish hook. Uh, so they would refuse their left flank all during the winter of 1864 and 65. The next extension of the Union line would come in February of 1865 at the battles at, at Hatcher's Run, uh, in which the Federals then extended their line about three miles farther to the west and it would be from there that they would launch their final uh, assaults that would wind up in, ca in finally capturing Petersburg. Now this fort, Fort Welch, and all along the line we have been walking, is significant because it is the location in, from December of 64 through the spring of 1865 of the Union Sixth Corps. Now the Sixth Corps had been in the Shenandoah Valley, fighting with Sheridan. They had been successful in defeating General Early's forces in the Shenandoah Valley. They were then transferred back to Petersburg. They took this position here, and this is where they spent the winter. And on March 25th, as a result of the huge Confederate offensive at Fort Stedman, the Sixth Corps and the Second Corps off to, their, off to their west made an advance against the Confederate line under the premise that Confederates must have been weak somewhere to have accumulated so many troops at Fort Stedman. That was a key, and that, that fighting is generally known as the Battle of Jones Farm, although it has a, a number of different names. That was a key engagement to setting up the, uh, the, the penultimate Union assault at Petersburg on the morning of April 2nd, 1865. Let's walk up to the, the platform here where we get a view over the field of fire. Now, General Grant had begun his final offensives on March the 29th. He moved the Union 5th Corps and the Union 2nd Corps off to the west along with Sheridan's cavalry uh, in order to try to cut the last supply lines leading into Petersburg, the Boyden Plank Road and the Southside Railroad. He fought a battle on the 29th of March at Lewis Farm or Quaker Road. Oh, look at the turkeys running out here in the open field. Something you often see out here. Uh, then on March 31st, they fight the battle at White Oak Road and at Dinwiddie Courthouse. On April 1st, the fight occurs at Five Forks, which is almost always in the general histories portrayed as the end of the Petersburg campaign. No, 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 no. Those of us who have a vested interest in April 2nd would, would, uh, would dare to contradict that. But the opening that was created by the battle at Five Forks led to orders from Grant to Meade and Meade to General Wright, the commander of the Sixth Corps, and General Burnside, commander of the Ninth Corps, and General Gibbon, commander of the 24th Corps, to make an all-out assault on the Confederate lines at dawn on April 2nd, 1865. The main Union Sixth Corps line was right here, extending all the way from Fort Ermston on our to the east of us, around to Fort Gregg, a little bit to the west of us, a huge two or three mile length of line, and most of the Sixth Corps, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 14,000 troops, would eventually, at dawn, move out from these positions here, across these open fields, and in the wood line in the distance was the Confederate main line. And the attack that occurs at dawn on April 2nd is the one that's going to basically end the Petersburg campaign. Gary? Yeah, I think that's great, Will. And I just love being out here. And uh, love for those members of the American Battlefield Trust who help with this effort. Please know that we started walking out here. We were on American Battlefield Trust property. Then we were on National Park Service property as we are now. But basically everything you see in front of us here was is American Battlefield Trust property and it was wooded not six seven years not seven years ago 
there was a farmer's field or two out there, but it was all woods the whole way. There was a, a lane going through it and you really couldn't understand what was going on. So thank you to everybody who helped us not only preserve this land, but also the extensive restoration effort that was done under our land steward, Matt George, plus the National Park Service and Pamplin Historical Park. Let me mention that the trail we were able to lay out actually goes all the way across this field. You see one of the signs right here in cooperation with the National Park Service. And then at the end of that, that wood line that Will pointed out in the distance, that's Pamplin Historical Park. Park. So between three different entities, the breakthrough battlefield, the April 2nd, really what finally broke through the Petersburg line is finally preserved. And uh, this is just great. Do you have something to add, Will? Well, I think uh, if you asked most Civil War students uh, whether or not, what, what was the, what's the best, most evocative walk to parallel and attack, many would say walking the picket Pettigrew charge at Gettysburg from the Virginia Monument across to the Angle. Fair enough. But for my money, this is one of the most dramatic walks that you can take in all of the Civil War history. Walking from the Union position across the trust land onto Pamplin Historical Park land in the footsteps of the Sixth Corps in such a dramatic event that ends the Petersburg campaign. And if you were to ask the soldiers of the Sixth Corps what was the most important day of their entire Civil War career, to a man they would say April 2nd. And I like to go out into this field and just imagine them waiting waiting for this early morning attack on april 2nd and you can go out there and listen to the you know sounds of nature and imagine them laying there before they you know got into a sort of a wedge and made this attack we'll talk about this more but let's uh let me just thank you for watching and end here with a moment of zen so maybe you can picture those things <laughs>